worship team. God is good. Amen? And I'm excited to be here, even if I'm the only one. And today's message is truth has a voice. How many of you have a voice? Amen? You can talk, you can speak, or you can communicate in some way. Well, I was talking to someone this week. Darlene, you kind of inspired me this week. And uh, we were talking about something in my office. Some people ask me, Pastor Jim, how do you get your messages? I talk to people. And then the Holy Spirit will quicken something in me. Uh, there's several t- times I'll talk with my wife or, or various people, and God will inspire something. But we were talking about the nature of addiction and how it works. And we were talking about how when people are in that culture, to where they were raised in that culture, it's hard for them to break free because they don't see anything wrong with it. You know, it's like when you're raised in a culture of dysfunction, you don't realize function is an option. Does that make sense? So if you're raised in a culture of addiction... If you're raised in a culture of sin, then you don't know that freedom is an option. And that's kind of how I grew up. I grew up from the moment I was born. My mother mother and father drank alcohol and did drugs while I was in the womb. I was given marijuana and alcohol as a baby. Um, My parents would put whiskey in my bottles to get me to fall asleep. Okay, so I woke up at two years old. My parents have pictures of me. Now, don't raise your hand because this may imply guilt. But I wonder how many people remember those little short Miller bottles way back in the late 70s. I said not to raise your hand. <laughs> I said don't raise your hand. All right. Well, I have pictures of me drinking those. My parents have pictures of me drinking those, and I couldn't have been two years old. I was a little tiny little thing. So see, I was trained from a baby to be addicted. I was trained from a baby to see all these things, and because as a baby I, I, I saw these things in my life, I assumed that it was just normal. So I was raised in this culture, in this atmosphere, and sometimes people that know me roll their eyes when I say this, but my dad was a drug dealer, neighbors on each side, guy across the street. It was just normal. Everyone did drugs. Everyone drank alcohol. In my high school, there was no voice that said you shouldn't be doing this because everybody was doing it. Everybody was sleeping around. Everybody was doing the things they weren't supposed to do. So I was raised in a culture where I was surrounded by drugs. I was surrounded by alcohol. There was pornography readily available on my television. My parents stole the package because if you all remember those old cable boxes that you could stick the card in. You all know what I'm talking about, thieves, right? Stick that card in, and then you get them extra channels. Well, my parents did that. So I was able to get all those channels. When my parents went away from home, I would watch all the stuff I wasn't supposed to watch. I would go in the bathroom and look at all the magazines I wasn't supposed to look at. I would do all the things that I wasn't supposed to do because it was just normal for me. I didn't know I wasn't supposed to do these things. My dad encouraged it. My dad, didn't, he didn't care that, that I was involved in these things. It was just, he was almost proud of me. On my 13th birthday... You know what my dad did? He took me to all the local watering holes and got me so drunk I couldn't see straight. I get home, and there are my grandparents with a surprise birthday party for me, and I'm like, how dumb. Didn't think anything. It was just normal. It's just the way it was. I just thought, you know, hey, I guess I'm an adult now, whatever. Um, I guess I can be public with my drunkenness now. And then there were these people that would come by on Saturdays. You know, you had your Jehovah's Witnesses, you had your Mormons. But then you had, if you're from the west end of Louisville, you know all about some Shawnee Baptist. Okay? Because Shawnee Baptist was aggressive in their message. I'm going to tell you what, I thank God for Shawnee Baptist. Up in the hood at Portland, knocking on doors and telling people the truth about Jesus. The problem is, I was raised to believe a few things. And they became truth to me. And here's the few things that I was raised to believe. Number one, the police were the enemy. People of color were less than I was. Now, I was taught to believe these things. Okay, doesn't mean that they are truth. Amen? I was taught to believe that drugs and alcohol was something that was just normal. And that... Sex was just a means for gratification. I was taught these things as a child growing up. That's just what I was taught. 
I remember as when people who had the nerve to be of another color walking through my neighborhood. I'm going to be real. I'm going to be real this morning. Is that okay? And my dad would make fun of them, call them derogatory terms. And I'm sitting on the front porch thinking that's just how you treat people. And I remember one day they came walking down the street in my neighborhood. And what happened? I began to use the derogatory terms that my dad began to use. The only difference was I wasn't my dad's size. And there were several of them in me. It took a turn very quickly, and I realized, okay, well, well, I need to be more careful, but it didn't break my thinking. See, I was taught these things. I remember the first time, can, can I be real? Is it okay? I remember the first time I saw a black person in my life. And I'll be honest, I was, the way I was taught, I thought I was looking at, a, at an alien. I was probably about four years old. I had no idea what it was. I just stu- stared at him. And he had a derogatory name as a nickname. That word that you're thinking, that, that was his nickname. That's what my dad called him. It's, it's, it's bizarre. But, but, and I was just like, I did, I did not know what I was looking at. Isn't it, isn't it amazing how someone can be raised so ignorant of truth? And see, that's the truth that I was taught. And that's the truth that was real to me. And see, when these religious nuts would come to my house, which is what my dad called them, I didn't have any time for them. Those were just liars. They were just zealots, crazy people. And see, what would happen is the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses would come help confirm they were crazy because, you know, they taught the crazy stuff and made them all look crazy. Another thing that my dad taught me is that rich people are the reason for my problems. His nickname for rich people, please forgive me, were turds. That's what he called them, turds. You know, Scotty the turds, you know, they're, they're keeping us down. And I believe that. So I grew up hating rich people. I grew up racist. I grew up thinking drug addiction was normal. I grew, I grew up thinking that religious people were crazy. I grew up thinking all these different things And see, something happened that my dad did not anticipate. And that is, I went to Shawnee High School. Now, if you know anything about the West End of Shawnee High School, Shawnee is primarily a black school. And I hung out with this teacher, and I wish I could remember his name, but I sat there and I talked with him every single day. And it was awkward at first, because one thing my dad told me, I'm just being real here, he said, never touch them because you'll never get the smell off of you. Now, I'm ser- the people are taught these things, and they're not true. I'm being real this morning. I hope I'm allowed, because I'm about to drop some truth bombs that can set some people free. So I was afraid to get near people of color because of what I'd been taught, but it was a lie. And I remember sitting next to him, and I didn't recognize any particular smell, and I noticed he was a very nice man. So I began to talk to him, and I remember I talked to him every day at lunch. He would sit at this table, and kids would just gravitate to him. He was the kindest man I'd ever met. And I sat down with him, and he would just pour knowledge into us kids. And we would, we would, they would scatter, and, and I would just sit there and listen to him. And I remember the moment I forgot he was black. I'll never forget. I was sitting there, and I looked up, and I was like, wait a minute. That's a black man. I forgot. And then I thought, my dad's not right. He's been lying to me about this. He'd tell me, if you bring any of your little black friends home, because he started noticing. He started noticing. Now, if my dad ever shows up to church here, please. um, You know, uh, things, look, I'm going to be honest. He's not changed a whole lot. Okay? He's not changed a whole lot, but the man needs Jesus. So please don't, don't bring the beat down if he comes to church here, okay? Let's show compassion. I'm just being real this morning. He said, if you bring any of your little black, black friends home, I'm going to whip them and I'm going to whip you. So think about the things that I thought was true growing up. And then you notice every now and then those, those, those lies begin to tumble because you experience something different. And I remember thinking, okay, that, that's not right. So then I started making friends with the people at my school. And, of course, I didn't bring them home because I didn't want them beat up, and I didn't want to be beat up, so I'd go to their house. But I learned that that was a lie, but it never really dawned on me that everything else was a lie, too. And I, I began to struggle with some things, and, 
And I still have my drug addiction habits because guess what? Addiction, pornography, and all, they don't know a color, right? So we got together and we did all the same stuff that we did with everyone else. We partied and we, we did all these other things and, you know, it was like, whatever. But I turned 19 years old. And I kind of fast forward through a lot of stuff because, you know, I don't want to burden you with details that are unnecessary. But I met Beth. And here I was in the midst. Now, I was still racist. Don't get me wrong. I still had these racial tendencies in my head because they've been taught all my life. But I was coming around. And I was learning some things. And then the second little thing that was about to fall was that drugs and alcohol are just a normal thing. Because Beth, she wasn't into all that. And whenever I did these things, she would kind of speak negatively about them. She wouldn't, like, beat me down or anything, but she would just speak negatively. And that was the first person that had ever said anything negative about my drug addiction and my drug habits. It was, it was like a voice ringing out. So the first voice of truth, and I, oh, I wish I remembered that man's name. But it was a voice of truth in my life that racism is a product of teaching, not a product of nature. Are you hearing me? We learn hatred. It's a, her, it's, a, it's a learned trait. And he was a voice of truth in my life. And he didn't say anything about, I don't particularly remember him mentioning anything about black, white, whatever. <clears throat> I just remember him being my friend. And that voice of truth broke down a lie in my life. And then Beth came along, and I recognized, you know what, this addiction is hindering me. There's things in my life that are stopping me from achieving what I want to achieve. And one thing is I wanted to keep her around. I wanted to make sure that I didn't lose her because I valued her in my life. So she became kind of a second voice of truth. And then once Beth came into my life and I wanted her to be a fixture in my life, I recognized, okay, I've got to change some things. How do I change? What do I do to change? So what did I start doing? Those religious nuts. They came knocking on my door. Maybe they were onto something. Because, see, I have my own religious nut in my family, my Aunt Mary Ann and my Uncle Owen. Now, when I was a little boy, they gave me those religious nut records. Now I don't have to explain what records are because they made a comeback. But just in case you don't know, they're very large CDs that you stick on this thing that turns around. You stick a needle on it, and they go, 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 and play music. She would give them to me, and it was Gaither and the Sunday School Picnic. I am a promise. I am a possibility, I am a promise, with a capital P. And I listened to it because I'm a great big bundle of potentiality. And it said, and I am learning to hear God's voice, and I am trying to make the right choice. I am a promise to be anything God wants me to be. You know, I was probably about nine years old the last time I had that record. But I remember those songs. God loves to talk to boys while they're fishing. I don't agree with that one because I hate fishing, but, but, but whatever. If, if he talks to you while you're fishing, then, then God bless you. Um, I'd rather talk, him talk to me in my air-conditioned room sipping Kool-Aid. Um, but whatever it is you enjoy, God likes to talk to you. And those words began to ring out in my mind as more and more voices of truth began. And I started thinking, you know what, maybe they're not crazy. Maybe I'm the crazy one. Maybe I'm the one that has it all backward. And I began to search for answers. And then God would move me from one location to another in my job. And he moved me to this one location where I was a valet parker. I parked cars for people that were on their way to work. And this one girl, she was probably 22, 23 years old. Don't know her name. We never had any real interaction, but she was a voice of truth in my life. Because she left her radio on. If you ever get your, valet car, if you ever get your car parked valet, please leave your radio on. And make sure it's not on like ACDC or something like that. Put it on Christian music. Or Christian teaching. Stick a CD in there of Christian teaching. Because I'm going to tell you what, that was another voice of truth. Because I would drive her car and Bob Rogers and several others were, were teaching. And I would listen to that. And I found myself lingering in that car longer and longer and longer. Why? Because see, there was a series of voices in my life that were leading me to a direction to recognize, you know what, what you're experiencing is not the way it's supposed to be. I know you're taught that's the way it's supposed to be. Because see, my parents had a phrase that was drilled in my head, and I never knew why. But they said, whatever you see here, whatever you do here, whatever you hear here, make sure that it remains here when you leave here. You know what that's called? That's called oppression. 
that's called don't talk about what we do because they knew what we were doing was wrong. They didn't want me to know. And I remember in the second grade, I know I just took a rabbit trail, but it's an intentional one. I had a teacher named Mr. Bass. He took me to the circus. We had a great time. We got home super late. And I remember Mr. Bass said, I'll drop you off because my parents couldn't come get me. They were probably drunk or something. But anyhow, we get to the house, and Mr. Bass decides to walk me in. And Mr. Bass had the typical look of a hippie. Um, and my dad noticed that look. He said, hey, man, you smoke doobies? I'm sitting right there. Mr. Bass said, yeah. They go in my kitchen and get stoned. Me being taught that that was normal, what do I do the next day at school? I'm proud. Mr. Bass got high with my dad. The next day, Mr. Bass was fired. <laughs> yeah. So then that's when my mom and dad emphasized the whatever you see here, whatever you say here, whatever you do here, whatever you hear here, make sure it remains here when you leave here. Um, but, you know, there were little things that happened in my life that made me question the things that I was taught was normal. So after I valet parked this girl's car, see, that's the great thing about the condition they try to put on you and label as ADHD is you have the ability to jump stories in a second. I call it a gift and get right back. The car. Then there was another lady. Her name was Tola. And Tola was uh, an attractive woman. She was, she was probably in her 40s, maybe pushing 50s. She was a very well put together woman. And I just remember noticing that about her. She carried herself with joy. And I always wondered, what's up with Miss Tola? So then one day, and I, I think some of you heard this story, she came to me with this set of gifts. And she handed them to me. And she said, over the next 12 days, I'm going to give you gifts until Christmas. And every day she gave me gifts, and, and every day, now remember, I'm on a journey here, right? I've, I've had these voices of truth that speak into my life that are getting me. I've already listened to Christian music. I'm getting in line. I'm starting to get this desire, this hunger, this desperation to know, how can I get free from this lifestyle? The last uh, gift she gave me was a Bible, and I began to read that Bible. And that hunger in me to change became insatiable. I could no longer function until I knew how to get free from this lifestyle. I was reading this book and I was hearing about truths I'd never heard in my life. Because see, I grew up a Catholic and one thing a good Catholic boy does is he gives in the offering, he shows up for church, he takes communion and he doesn't read his Bible. That's just that's what I did. I was never taught to read my Bible. I was never taught to do any of these things. And, and look, that is my personal experience. Someone else may have a different experience, but that was my personal experience. We weren't taught to read the Word of God. So when I started reading the Word of God, I began to see some things I'd never saw before. And I saw joy, and I saw peace, and I saw freedom, and I began to want it. Because I couldn't find it, I began to become really angry. And here's what I did. I reverted and got worse. I started cussing more than I'd ever cussed. I started doing all the other things more than I'd ever done them. And there was this little guy. His name was Larry. Another voice of truth. Now one thing about these voices of truth, some of them were not even Christians. God will use whatever it takes in order to get your attention. If he can use a donkey, he can use an unsaved man. But he came up to me and he said, I see you reading your Bible every day. Why do you cuss so much? And I said, well, I'm not a Christian. And he said, well, why do you read your Bible every day if you're not a Christian? Well, because I want to be one. And he said, well, you need to find you a church. I said, but I've been to a few and none of them look like this. I want one that looks like this. And he said, I know of one. I'll meet you there on Sunday. Joker didn't show up. But anyhow, two weeks later, another voice of truth came into my life. His name was Phil. And he preached the gospel. And I became a child of God that day. And everything changed in my life from that moment. A month later, I was baptized. Ten months later, God called me into ministry. And then the rest is history. But there was at some point a voice of truth that began to speak into my lies. So hopefully I didn't lose you all in the story. But can I tell you that you can be that voice of truth? Romans chapter 10. You go with me to verse 13. It says, For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. 
Now, if it stopped there, we'd have an interesting text, right? So all I have to do is call on the name of the Lord, and I shall be saved. But then it gives a process. Listen to what it says. It says, how can they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. See, folks, it's not enough to know the truth. We have got to preach the truth. And I did not say me. I said we. Amen? Everyone is called to be voices of truth in people's lives. There is no one unreachable by the truth except for those who are around people who won't speak it. It's got to come out of your mouth. What would have happened if Shawnee Baptist would have never knocked on my door? What would have happened if my aunt, Mary Ann, and Owen would have never given me those records? What would have happened if my wife, who was my girlfriend then, would have never resisted my addiction? What would have happened if I'd have never met that black man at the kitchen table or at, or at the table in the cafeteria at school? What would have happened if that girl wouldn't have left the Christian radio on? What would have happened if Tola wouldn't have obeyed the voice of God and given me gifts? What would have happened? I'm where I am because the voice of truth showed up in my life on multiple occasions. And it transformed me each time. And sometimes it happens instantaneously, and sometimes it's a process. But I want to remind you of something. Sometimes you are the only voice of truth that the people around you have. Just like my Aunt Marianne and Owen, they were the only Christians that I knew personally. Now, we had the guys that knocked on the door. I'm talking about the people I knew personally. I watched their lives and recognized those are weirdos right there. Those are for real weirdos. It's just what we thought. And again, I'm not trying to beat to get Catholics. It's just what I was raised, and I was taught. When I went to my grandmother's house, when Marianne and Owen began to talk that junk, my grandparents shut them down. You don't talk about that stuff here. Because, you know, they would, they would say negative things about different elements of the Catholic Church. And that wasn't, that wasn't happening in my grandmother's house. So we always kind of thought they were loony. But for some of you, you are the only voice of truth that they have. So there's some ways you can utilize. Number one, one thing I would challenge you to do, because something my Aunt Marianne did, I can only tell you things that I've experienced, but my Aunt Mary Ann would give every single grandkid a gift. She would go to the DAV. She would go to the Goodwill. She'd do whatever. And she would find Christian things to give us that would have some sort of message. And I'm sure those records that she gave me were used because they were very commonplace back then. It's amazing how, what you can get on eBay. Get a few CDs or something. They're, yes, they're going to think you're weird. Yes, they're going to think, because that's what I thought. And my aunt and uncle give me the dumbest gifts. That's seriously what I thought. They give me the dumbest gifts, but then I'd be playing my records, and I'm like, I wonder what's on it. And I listened to it, and it had a nice little beat to it, so I was like, this isn't that bad. So I would listen to it, and I would hear it. You never know. But if you don't say anything, how are they going to change? See, how can they believe on them whom they've not heard and how can they hear unless someone preaches to them? See, folks, we got to start talking. we got to start talking. we got to start using our voices in order to be beacons of truth. So the first thing I want you to know is, for some people, you are the only voice of truth that exists in their life. You've got to use your voice. Now, I'm not saying be obnoxious and cram Jesus. You know what? That's one thing my Aunt Mary Ann and my Uncle Owen did not do. They did not try to turn every family reunion into church. But what they did do is they used subtle ways to get the message out there. You know, by giving us gifts and various things. Because what kid's not going to take a gift? You know, because we, whenever Christmas comes along, we always, we have these kids. Now, what are the rules? Number one, say thank you. Number two, if you've already got it, don't say, I've already got this one. And number three, if you don't like it, keep your mouth shut. It's just kind of the rules, right? So that's what I did. I kept my mouth shut. And eventually, you know, I would open the, the, the book or, or listen to the record. And it was a little voice of truth in my life. I had no idea what it meant. 
but now I can recall those songs from memory. The second thing is it takes time to penetrate a deeply believed lie. Are you hearing me on that? It takes time to penetrate a deeply believed lie. Why do you think that our country is still overcoming the trauma of slavery and racism? It's because it takes time to overcome a deeply believed lie. That lie was perpetuated from the very beginning of the foundation of this country. It's going to be very difficult for us to break free of it 50 years after we finally recognize, okay, this is all the way wrong. That's just part of the way wrong. Not just a little bit wrong. This is all the way wrong. Okay, it's going to take us some time to overcome that because it takes time to overcome a deeply believed lie. And there's lies that we believe deeply as a society, especially unsaved. And one of them is I'm never going to get free from this addiction. There may be people that think, you know what, I actually recognize this wrong, but I, I'm never going to get free. Every time I try it, it knocks me back down again. Another deeply believed lie is I'll always be a failure. Everything I do messes up. I'm never going to overcome this. I'm never going to get that better job. And another deeply believed lie is I am doomed to turn out just like my parents. If my parents were this way, I'm going to be this way. If my parents had this disease, then I'm going to get this disease. Another deeply believed lie is I will always be depressed. I will never be free. I'm just going to have to manage it. Another deeply believed lie is there's nothing wrong with casual sex. There's nothing wrong with drugs. There's nothing wrong with getting drunk. There's nothing wrong with these things. All these religious nuts are just telling me this stuff to make me feel bad. These are deeply believed lies by our society. And a lie repeated long enough becomes truth. How many people went and told President Madison that the British were coming? How many made it? How many started off? Four. Paul Revere was not the only one. Paul Revere was actually captured. But we were taught in school that Paul Revere was the hero of the story. It's a lie. It was perpetuated generation after generation after generation after generation. And when you hear the British are coming, what's the first name you associate with that? Paul Revere. It's a lie. He didn't make it. He was captured by the British soldiers. William Dawes, there were, several, there, was, there, were, there were three other guys. And I can't remember which one actually made it to get the message where it needed to go, but it was not Paul Revere. It's a lie. Check it out. I've got a book called American Myth and Legend. It will blow your mind how many things you were taught in school that are not just fancy truths. They're outright lies and we've been taught that they were true so a lie repeated long enough becomes truth especially if the lie begins when you're little why do you think they're trying to perpetuate the lie that that gender is not uh is is, is a choice now they're starting with little ones right and raising them all up to believe these things and we're going to have a confused generation but there's a voice of truth There's a voice of truth that can speak out and say, this is what the Lord says. This is the truth. The word is near you and in you and in your mouth. It's time to let it out. Amen. Amen. Help me. Third thing. I'm going to move on from that one. Lies have a voice. And they have a father. If you go back to Genesis chapter 3, it, it may be up on the screen, but I'm just going to paraphrase. Basically, Adam and Eve are in the garden. God had given Adam his instructions. Don't eat from the fruit, the tree in the middle of the garden, because the day you eat it, you're going to die. Well, then along comes the serpent, and he's looking for a voice because he doesn't have one. So he deceives Eve, and once he deceives Eve, now the lie has a voice in mankind. Amen? The lie has a voice. The lie is through the voice of Eve. And then it says, and she gave some to her husband who was with her. So the lie passed on from one person to another. And that lie has been perpetuating for generations now. For generations, that lie has gone on and on and on. In John chapter 8, verse 44... 
Jesus said, you are of your father the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he's a liar and the father father of lies. So it is important that we speak truth. Because when we speak truth, we become a voice of truth in the midst. Because look, what do we have to do in order for lies to be perpetuated? Only one thing we got to do. Zip up the mouth and don't. And what do Christians do? Don't want to make no waves. Just going to keep my mouth shut. Just going to go on about my business, do my job, and let these people act a bunch of fools. And I'm just going to go home and live a life. That is not being a voice of truth. We have got to speak it, folks. We've got to talk about it. We've got to. And I'm not saying go to your work and turn it into a church service. Don't get fired being a dummy. Amen. I'm the only one that go to work and make it a church service. If you work at somewhere outside of a church, then you probably ought to try to be a voice of truth within that context. Just like my aunt and uncle did, by giving gifts, by being kind to people, by noticing things in people's lives. And it's okay if you see somebody struggling, can I pray with you? And whenever you see an opportunity to be a vegan of truth, whenever you hear a lie perpetuated, that's all you do is combat it with the truth. No, that's not the way it is. Here's the way it is. And the Spirit of God will back you. He will help you. Lies have a voice and lies have a father. Then the last thing is truth has a voice and truth has a father. Jesus, in chapter, uh, John chapter 14, verse 6, it says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. But from now on, you know him and you have seen him. Jesus said, I'm the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And see, here's the thing. Do you realize that a lie needs a person and a voice, and truth needs a person and a voice? So why do you think God became Jesus? And walk this planet because he became a voice of truth. He became the voice of truth. And then he transferred that truth to other people. See, truth can be transferred from one person to another. Truth comes from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. But they don't gain a voice until they're spoken to by a person. Just like a lie entered through mankind. See, the lie was not effective. See, Satan, it says he was a liar from his creation, from the beginning. He lied. Now, we know the story that he started off, and that, that big mystery is how did, how did he get sideways. and We don't know, but the, we know that there was a point in the beginning before mankind where he became a liar, and lying became his nature. But it did not have an impact on Adam and Eve until Adam and Eve believed the lie and began to speak it. That's when it took hold on mankind. Jesus came and he flipped the script and he became truth. And he began to transfer that to mankind through the voice of the Holy Spirit. Now I'm going to show a clip real quick and look. I know when you show movie clips, um, there's some controversy involved in it. And I know that sometimes people think, well, I'm going to show a clip from Supergirl. Okay, now number one, I do not believe in aliens. Okay, I do not necessarily support every message that this show sends. However, there was a scene in this movie that I found powerful because a voice of truth began to speak into someone's life. And I want you to check it out and then we'll finish. What are you doing here? I told you not to come. I warned you what would happen if you worked against me. I found your ultimate opponent, one that knows your every weakness. I'm, I'm not doing this. I'm not going to fight my sister. Did you hear that, Nan? If you want to fight me, come out here and do it yourself. I'm not going to hurt her. You have no choice. Kill Alex Danvers or let her kill you. Either way. You lose. Recognize this? It's the same sword your sister used. To kill Astra. It's almost justice. Alex, 
please wake up. She can't hear you. Revenge won't bring Astra back. I don't want to bring her back. I want you to join her. in the light of Rao? You tell her. Her wishes have all come true. Alex, stop! This isn't you! The Martian's protecting your mind. Who knows for how long by the looks of him. As long as he has to. Well, if only he could have protected Alex's. Now her mother has to watch. Alex, you can beat this! I know you can. You are not going to hurt me. You are not going to hurt Kara. We are a family, stronger together. Alex, you are the strongest of us all. Your father always said that. I know he is watching over you. I know he'd be so proud. Your father believed in you. I believe in you, too. You are Alex Danvers. And nothing on Earth can change that. So, come back to us, sweetie. Please, come back. Mom? Yes. Oh, God. Sorry. I'm sorry. It's all right. It's all right. What had happened? I'm so sorry. Is there were de several different planets of alien forces fighting against Earth for control. And they implemented this thing called Myriad. And Myriad was a way to control everyone's minds. But see, there were some people with stronger minds, and there were some people that were wise to it and were able to protect themselves from it. But it took over the whole Earth, and they did whatever these evil people wanted to do. And I was reminded of Satan and his mission to destroy mankind and to get them to believe the lies. Because if you think about it, it seems like everyone is controlled by this thing, doesn't it? It seems like everyone is marching the wrong way, and it seems like even the church is, what is our response? We get mad. We complain. We get upset, and they shouldn't act this way. But there was only one thing that broke through, and that's someone spoke the truth. And I think it's very interesting because um, those were sisters that were fighting, not biologically, obviously, but the mother come in. And she began to tell her who she was. She told her her name. And it broke her free from that bondage, from that control. And I think all of us know people in our lives that are bound. And we know that something greater is inside of them. I just wonder if I could get a little music. We close out. But they know something's greater inside of them. And they need somebody to speak truth over them. And that voice is can be you. So I want to remind you, for some people, you are the only voice of truth that person has. Don't get discouraged. Number two, it takes time to penetrate a deeply believed lie. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14 and 15 tells us to speak the truth in love. Can I tell you that a truth spoken in anger Sounds like hate. Our tone means everything. The way we present truth means everything. Because you you've all heard of Westboro Baptist Church, right? 
That's the group that's, that, that's putting up the signs. And there's some truth in some of the things they say. Homosexuality is a sin. There are some people that are going to hell. But the problem is the truths that they tell are so engulfed with hatred and anger that nobody's paying attention to them. That's why it's so important to listen to Paul and speak the truth in love. One thing I tell people is never tell your friends they're going to hell without tears in your eyes. Let them see your compassion. Let them see your heart. Let them see that you're serious. Let them see that you care. Folks, it is important that we be a voice of truth, but it's also important that we do not let anger cloud our truth. Our tendency is to get frustrated. Our tendency is to get judgmental. But we've got to give truth a voice. John 8, 32. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I'm going to ask you to stand. And look, I know that it's probably the committed core that's here this morning that braved the rain. But maybe there's some of you, and you come to church, and you believe some lies, and the truths that you're hearing are beginning to penetrate. Then I'm going to ask you to surrender completely to the one who is the truth, and that is Jesus. But I would be willing to bet that each and every one of you have people in your life who are in bondage. Maybe they're just like I was growing up. Maybe they're racist. Maybe they're addicted. Maybe they're obnoxious and loud and crazy, whatever. But you can be the voice of truth in their life. Some of you work in places where you don't realize the level of influence that you have because you've never let the truth come out. Because if you're a Christian, if you believe in Jesus and you're sincere about it, they already recognize something's off with you. So you might as well let it come out of your mouth. Amen? I'm a child of God. Leave the radio on. Roll the windows down. You know those listening to the music with the bad words in it and the bad lyrics? They ain't afraid to leave the windows down and crank it up. Right? You leave the windows down and you crank it up. Because there is power in the name of Jesus to break every train. Turn it up! Can I tell you another thing? We got to stop letting, I'll just invite them to church, be our cop out. We are the church. Jesus said something. I watched a video yesterday. I thought it was profound. When they asked Jesus about himself, you know what he said? Come and see. Come and see. We need to invite people into our lives. Tell them, come and see. You want to know what I'm about? Come and see. Come check me out. Come see me in real life. But be that voice of truth. Truth has a voice, and it's you. So if you would just say, just as we close out this morning, please don't forget to go by and grab a hot dog, grab something to eat uh, to make it a little more affordable for our kids to go this Wednesday. But if you say, I'm willing to be that voice of truth, I'm willing to reach out to those in in my influence and in my surroundings, I'm going to ask you to come forward. We're just going to, we're going to pray together. If you need something specific, then Raise your hand. We'll pray with you. Say, I'm willing to be that voice of truth. Jesus. Jesus. Of 
Is there anybody that will say, I, I, need, I need specific prayers regarding something in my life. I'd love to pray with you. Just get your hand up. given us the truth. Can I tell you that if I wouldn't have gotten rid of the lie by somebody speaking truth, I would have missed out on some of my favorite people. Some of my favorite people. This man is such a joy to be around. And he calls me out sometimes. And I'm okay with that because he's being a voice of truth in my life. I thank God that it was a lie. So, Father, we're not going to perpetuate the lies. We are going to be a voice of truth. Lord, help us to speak truth in the midst of lies. Lord, help us to remember that we may be the only voice of truth in that person's life. And they may have believed that lie for years, so it's not going to be just I'm going to speak it one time and oh, well, they didn't listen. We've got to penetrate that lie. We've got to keep hammering at that lie until it crumbles. Jesus. I want us to do something for just a minute. Just No singing. Just, just light music. And I just want you all to take and find a place to seek the Lord. Just find a place to just, 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 if you want to kneel down at your chair, if you want to come here at the altar, but I just want you to find a place to see God. We need His presence. Just seek Him.